Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in glory might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Thus far the reading of God's Word. Amen. Amen. Now, as I said, it, with question four, uh, we, it, it answer, we an, question four was answered with the teaching from Paul that this redemption of Christ was accomplished by Christ when He faced the cross and He rose again from the tomb and is then applied to each of His people at their own, at, in their own lives by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit works to work in your own life, applying to you the benefits and blessings of Christ's own sacrifice. That refers, in other words, to the time in your own life when you truly became aware of the fact that you know for sure that you are a Christian. Now, you know, such a time of transition as that, from death to life, from dark to light, uh, while it's necessary for every true believer to have that, it nonetheless will vary in its experience and in its intensity. For instance, you, uh, you might have been born into a Christian family. You might have a wonderful testimony of the gospel always being the focus of your life and never knowing a time when you did not love the Lord as He has loved you. But there will be others of us with just the opposite experience of that. There will be indeed a time, perhaps a very specific moment in your own memory, when that sinful path, that sinful attitude, that sinful conduct that you had, you had that defined your life was suddenly arrested, suddenly changed. Perhaps you were in church, perhaps you were in a Bible conference or a Bible study, and all the uh, sudden it seemed you found yourself to be truly wanting to leave your old life behind, to embrace the Lord and the gospel, and you cried out to Jesus for salvation. Perhaps you were in despair at the moment. Perhaps it was in a time when life itself to you meant nothing anymore. Perhaps you lost someone dear. You suddenly realized your strength was gone. You needed somebody else in whom you could rely. Each one of God's people are different. We come from completely different backgrounds. And therefore, each person's conversion story is going to be different. But that is where the difference among us actually stops. We all come from different backgrounds, maybe even in different cultures, we all bear different scars from our past. We're dealing with different consequences as a result of our sins or perhaps because we were sinned against. But after the Lord gets a hold of you, you now embark on a path 
that is well-worn, a path that many others have taken before you, a path that all believers walk together. For we are all called and committed to follow Christ. We are called to put off the old self. We're called to put on the new, to be transformed by the renewal of your mind, and becoming more and more like Christ. That is our calling in life, and that means we walk together. And in looking at Paul's doxology here, we're now coming to the question number five. What has God's redemption left with me? Christ's redemption has been accomplished at the cross. Christ's redemption has been applied to me by the Holy Spirit in that change of life that has happened to me. But now my question is, what has the Lord left with me? What do I have now? And the answer is this. God's redemption has left me with every spiritual blessing, with my part and role within the church of Christ, and with a sure hope by which I now live the, to, for Christ. So the first thing we're going to look at this morning is God has left us with every spiritual blessing. Now, let's review very quickly then. We come across that word blessing again. Let's review what's meant by that word. To be blessed means only one thing for a Christian, and that is that no matter what you must deal with, no matter what you must face in life, you have a saving relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. And as Paul says here, it is a relationship that goes both ways. You don't have just a one-sided relationship with someone else and call that person a friend. Call that person someone close to you, a loved one. The bond between the two of you must mean something to both. That's why Paul can say that we are blessed for the Father has sent the Son. The Father has called us to Himself and called us His own, adopted us. And that is also why Paul can call the Father blessed, because it has always been His desire to be in relationship with His people, to call them His people and to have them call Him their God. So the very first and most critical benefit of being blessed is to know that you are no longer alone in the world. No matter what else you must deal with, no matter what else you must endure, you are in communion with the Father through the Son. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And because that relationship is your foremost blessing, it is something vital for you to cultivate. You must seek out the worship of God. You know, I stressed this last week, talking about the order of worship. You remember, we walked through those parts of worship that are sometimes overlooked or, or dismissed. And I stress that uh, not only must you aim to commune with God, which, which a Christian does privately, but you also must allow yourself to be instructed and led in the act of worshiping God. For that is the primary way that you bless God in return for His bond with you. And that is why the purity of your worship is so very important. You do not attend a worship service just for your own benefit. You do not attend just to get revved up emotionally. You don't come just to get something out of it yourself, just to learn something new from the sermon. You give to God the worship He deserves. He is worthy of your worship. He tells you in the Scriptures how He wants you to worship Him, what that worship is to look like, what that worship service is to include. And it is worthy of you to give Him what He wants. And then along with corporate worship, you must also cultivate a regular discipleship consisting of an active prayer life and a time daily and frequently of reading the Word of God on your own. 
God blesses you in your prayer talk with Him. It's one of the first things that we cast aside when we aren't feeling very spiritual, when the burdens come upon us, when we feel very pitying of ourselves, woe is me. It's one of the first things we set aside is prayer to God. Why? Because we're afraid of what He's going to tell us. We don't want to hear it because we want to mope. We want to complain. We want to feel sorry for ourselves. We want an excuse to go off the path of sanctification and sin boldly before His face. You need to pray to God all your life as a Christian. And a regular time of Bible reading will teach you more and more about your God so that you are able to appreciate His attributes and His will. Our God is not like us. He even tells us that. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. You must be a student of your God to get to know Him. You can't just say, well, my God is like this, and my God is like that, and my God doesn't do that, and my God doesn't do this. Such a God is an idol. Such a God does not exist. You must be confronted with the God, the one and true living God, and get to know Him better so that you know who you are yourself. That is the calling of a Christian. That is your worship. That is how you bless the Lord. And as we noted also from Micah chapter 6, verse 8, you are to walk humbly with your God. You are to remember out there that you are a saint. Remember what a saint is? A saint is a sinner saved by grace. Nothing more. A sinner saved by grace. Putting others first. Uh, serving. Carrying your own cross must not just be nice Christian words. They must mean something. To be like Christ, you have to embrace your marching orders. You must follow Him. Well, now you can see how vital this blessing is to you as a believer. And that this relationship far exceeds any mere object or action that might come your way. And what I mean by that is this. Sometimes Christians call, you know, we're all tend to call certain turn of events, turns of events, I don't know which way to plural that, turns of event, turn of events, turns of events. We, we usually, we, we, we're all in the habit of calling such things of blessings. Sometimes Christians will, you know, if something happens good in your life, you get a good result from a doctor's visit or a test, and you call it a blessing. Oh, that's a blessing. And there's no doubt in my mind that God does not rain down showers of blessings upon His people. But we don't want to be like those who focus just on the gifts, just on the graces, to the expense of focusing on the giver of those graces. If we did that, we would fall into the habit of just calling such gifts blessings because we like them, because the things that happen to us meet our approval. But my friends, God's blessings are not just Christmas presents, not just, not always limited to the things that we like. God blesses us sometimes with what is called severe mercies. Things we might not welcome at the moment. Things we might not appreciate at the time, but things that are indeed what we need. What God sees fit to give us. Or what is necessary for us in the providence of God. Those two, my friends, are blessings from the giver of every good and perfect gift. To properly understand and receive all the blessings that God has to give us is to interpret everything in your life, everything in your life, by what you read in the Word of God and how you have learned of His ways 
by worshiping Him. And Paul says the gifts of God's blessings are heavenly. The true gifts of God's blessings are heavenly gifts. They're not merely the the little things in this life which please or amuse or favor you uh, just for the moment, just for the brief time, and perhaps make your life a little easier at the moment. The blessings of God are going to be people and things that make and have a, an eternal significance. Things that are permanent. People and things that are valuable to you, precious to you spiritually, and are worthy in the long run, even if they are painful at the moment. Such blessings are laid up for you, Paul says, in the heavenly places where moth and rust cannot destroy and where the thief cannot break in and steal. Well, the second thing that this answer tells us is that God's redemption has also left me with with my part and my role within the visible church of Christ. Now, if you look over these verses again in your bulletin on, uh, on page 16... Look over those verses again. You'll notice that I have, uh, I have underlined all of the pronouns that, appear, that, that, that speak to this. And you might notice that all of the pronouns in this paragraph are plural. You might think, well, that's obvious. Paul's writing to a church. He's not writing to individual Christians. But let me ask you a question. Why isn't Paul writing to individual Christians? Some, of our, some, you see, are of the opinion that religion is a very private affair. My faith, my Christian life are not meant to be shared. It's just a matter between me and God. Pietists, historically, will commonly hold to this perspective. They seek to avoid sharing anything in their growing sanctification, their struggles, their spiritual lives. It's, it, I, I just don't want to share those things. Or they might wish to deal with their personal issues privately. Those of such a persuasion do not easily see the need or uh, in, the, in truth to be co- a committed member of a visible church. I don't see the point in being a member of a visible church. And they may even be in the habit of interpreting these writings of Paul as if he was indeed writing just to individual Christians. Paul tells me I have to do this. But Paul is not writing to individual Christians. Paul did not want believers to be on their own. He understood the call and the responsibility and the duty of believers to be one with one another in the visible church. The visible church was very important to Paul. That's why his three missionary journeys, that's what they were all about. Not merely for the conversion of individuals, but the creation, the organizing of visible churches all in every one of those cities and the raising up of governing elders over those churches. And all of Paul's letters with the exception of Philemon, were all written to churches or else to the pastors of churches. So the lesson is very clear. When a person becomes a believer, he must indeed seek out the worship of his God. And to do that, he must find a church that glorifies his name. And to do that, he must find that Paul would say it one that blesses God the Father. What is a good church? A good church is one that blesses God in the worship of His name. That is the church's top priority. That is the foremost reason the church of Christ exists. The blessing comes from the God the Father by enriching the life of the individual believer in the form of supportive fellowship, in the form of teamwork, working with other believers, 
and the spiritual shepherding and oversight of governing elders. Now, it is right there, right at that point, that many churches today fail their members. Right there where many churches today fail their own members. Many ministers and church leaders, probably since the beginning of the Christian age, have given in to the temptation of asking themselves only one question. How do I get more people in the door? And they might focus, for instance. I've been to church planting seminars and conferences, and it's just stunning what they tell you to focus on. You know, some might focus on what, what issues, what problems are there that the community shares in this area, and let's minister to those needs, those, those problems and those issues, and that will make us more popular, and more people will come. They might ask themselves, you know, what demographics do we have in this particular area? And we'll build the church so that it will look like the people around us. They might boast, we're a multiracial church. Or they only target young families, thank you very much. You know, now that I'm elderly, I'm downright offended at that. But I remember them saying, we, we don't want elderly people. We want the young people. We want the young families. And we're going to target them. And if we, if we get to some older ones, well, that's fine. But we're not, we're not targeting them. What, what, yeah. But my friends, that is the strategy for sales and for marketing. You know, you know the slogan. You invent the need, and then you fill the need. That's what they're doing. They're turning the church into a business. When your, when your top priority as a church is appealing to felt needs, when you promise your people that your mission as a church is to singularly satisfy your felt needs, whatever they happen to be, it's only going to be a matter of time before that ministry goes very, grows to be very unsatisfactory. And the people begin to grumble and complain at what a lousy job is being done by that church in meeting their needs. That's what happened in Timothy's church. If you turn back to the letter of 1 and 2 Timothy, later in time here, Timothy will be the pastor of guess which church? Ephesus. He will be the pastor of, his, of this church. He had widows in his church, you know, those troublesome elderly ladies. He had widows in his church that were merely being catered to. They were satisfying their felt needs. But as a result, those widows grew bored. They grew distracted. They drifted away from faithfulness in Christ. They began chasing after other things. Paul told Timothy, don't chase them out of the church but to compel them to look for the blessings that come from God and not from man. To call those widows to honor and to obedience. To call them to glorify God with their lives. James Boyce, previous pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church, wrote this. He said, Paul did not begin with man, as we tend to do, in our man-oriented, need-directed churches, Paul began with God. Moreover, he continued with God, knowing that anything of true spiritual value is accomplished only through God and by God's power. And he ended with God, too, in the sense that everything he did was for God's glory. When the church seeks, first and foremost, to bless God the Father, she will also draw more and more people to herself. And the people drawn to such a visible church as that will indeed get their first and absolute need met. They will stand before their God in the beauty of holiness 
and they will rejoice in the righteousness of their Savior. That's their first and foremost need. And as they do, lo and behold, guess what happens? Their own needs will begin to be met as well. Some of those needs, quote, they will just grow out of as they grow more mature in Christ. As they learn more and more from the Scriptures about who God is, they will mature spiritually and they will realize, I don't need this. I wanted it. I don't need it. Others, others of those needs will be indeed generously met as brothers and sisters see your, those needs and meet, run to meet them, not as a program, but as love and ministry and wish with eagerness to carry the burdens of each other in love. There's also a very interesting phenomenon that happens in such a church. The past failures that people bring with them into the church, you know, the sharpnesses, the sharp edges of their personalities, the unlikability that some have when they come into the church, the differences of opinion, the differences in politics, the differences in values, they all begin to meld together as the fellowship grows. They learn self-denial. They learn service. They, the rough edges begin to be chipped away. They all grow from their own origin, where they started, toward Christ. They become different people. The people of God become the sheep of His pasture. Might be an old joke, but you know sheep all look the same. The more and more we become like Christ, the more we become like the great shepherd's sheep. And then thirdly, Paul says, God's redemption has left me with a sure hope by which I will live for Christ. A sure hope. You know, hope is such a beautiful biblical word, isn't it? It's such a rich, beautiful, biblical word. It's, you know, it's used in Scripture as we use that word in other contexts and circumstances. We use the word hope when we're talking about something that we, we don't know how it's going to turn out, but we hope it turns out that way. Um, you know, if, if, it, if it looks like it's not going to happen, we say we hope against hope. We're, we're hoping that this will happen. We hope for a positive outcome. All we're... All we're saying by such a use, of course, is that we ex we're expressing our own preferences. This is what I'd like to see happen. Hope in Scripture is also used not only in that way on occasion, but it's also used in, in the way to express our absolute dependence on God. To, the believer dwells in hope. That is his life, his dependence on God. That's what we mean by the word hope. That he lives, he learns to live his life trusting God. Listen to what Paul says in Romans. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Beautiful words. But the way that Paul uses hope here in Ephesians 1 is a third way that the word hope is used in the Bible. And it adds a whole other dimension to this word. Your hope, dear Christian, your hope in and through and of your entire life, your hope in Christ is your fuel for living. It is your spiritual gasoline. Your hope is what drives you forward. 
As the writer of Hebrews says, we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope unto the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. It is your hope in Christ that motivates you in faith, that fills your spirit with an eagerness not to let the time go by in waste, not to be sluggish in earnestness, but to be imitators of all those other soldiers of the cross who have gone before you, those other saints who dwelt in the visible church of Christ, who didn't just have faith, who didn't just believe, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, but who lived by faith, who acted in faith, and who became sure of what they hoped for. Christian, is that you this morning? Does your sure hope drive you forward? Does it move you to live for praise to the glory of Christ? Cultivate your blessed relationship with God the Father. He blesses you. Worship Him in the spirit of holiness and bless His name. Worship Him, be committed to the visible representation of the Bride of Christ so that you are one in fellowship, name, word, and deed with other Christians. And live by your trust in Him and run the race that He has put out before you. Let's pray together.